el cabrenico que lo mercó mi padre por dos le paní por dos le paní y vino el perro y que mordió el gato si se me comió el cabrenico que lo mercó mi padre por dos le paní por dos le paní Welcome to Passover Around the World a multimedia concert we're so glad you've joined us for this virtual event. We have a wonderful evening planned for you today, some delicious food that you won't get to taste, some wonderful music. The musicians did original compositions specifically for this event, and an introduction to Jewish languages. I'm Dr. Sarah Bunin Benor, a professor at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. I'm the director of the newly founded Jewish Language Project, an initiative at HUCJIR. And I'm thrilled to be presenting our very first event. First, we would like to show you what Seder tables look like in various parts of the world. You might think of a Seder table as including a Seder plate, but it's not always a plate. In some cultures, it is a tray, like in the Bukharian tradition, or a basket tray in the Libyan tradition, or a Yemenite Seder table, where the entire table is covered with the ceremonial foods. And the ceremonial foods are different in each culture. Instead of salt water, some groups use lemon juice. And instead of the shank bone, uh, Yemenite Jews, for example, use a meat stew to represent the korban, the sacrifice. Sometimes maror is a radish or parsnip. And karpas can be parsley, but it can also be shredded beet salad. And in the Libyan Seder basket tray, we see some distinctive items. We see Belgian endive for maror, and the charoset is called lachlik, and it's made into little balls. And the karpas is celery. And in the Bukharian Seder tray, we see that the chazeret is romaine lettuce and the maror is a radish. And also they have lemon juice instead of salt water to represent the bitterness. Now these Seder tables, trays, and plates come from this wonderful book called Too Good to Pass Over by Jennifer Felicia Abadi, which has not only wonderful recipes, but also information about how Passover has been celebrated in various Jewish communities around the world. And we wanted to bring you a taste of that with the food samples that we were going to serve you. And I'm so sorry that I have to tell you about this and that you can't actually taste it in person. But here is the menu that we were planning to serve you at this event a food for several different locations with a language associated with it. So from Romania, where Yiddish was spoken, charoises, with apple, walnut, and wine. And from Morocco, where haketia, a Judeo-Spanish language, Judeo-Arabic, and Judeo-Berber are spoken, lachlik, a similar charoset, but made with date, walnut, ginger, etc. And from Iran, where Judeo-Persian and Judeo-Median are spoken, kuku sabzi, a baked herb omelet. From Azerbaijan, where judeo tat, also known as juhuri, was spoken. Badamjan choyagusht, eggplant onion frittata. From Georgia, where Judeo-Georgian was spoken, espanaki pali, ground walnut spread with spinach, garlic, coriander, and onion. And from Iraq, for dessert, haji badam, flourless almond cookies with rose water and cardamom. And we thank Got Kosher for their wonderful catering, and I hope you all get to try it sometime in the future. Let me tell you a little bit about Jewish languages by starting out with the Passover Haggadah, or Haggadah. The Haggadah is a document that helps Jews to do the ceremony on the eve of Passover. And in the traditional Haggadah, there are three languages. Most of it's written in Hebrew, 
Some aspects are written in Aramaic, Judeo-Aramaic, also an ancient language. And the word afikomen, the matzah that is eaten at the end of the Seder, is a word from Greek. But the Passover Haggadah has been translated into dozens of languages around the world. Here are just a few examples of the languages that the Haggadah has been translated into. And languages at the Passover Seder are just as diverse. Wherever Jews have lived, they have conducted the Passover Seder in a combination of Hebrew, Aramaic, maybe that one Greek word, Judeo-Greek, and their local language. What are those local languages? Well, that goes back to antiquity. If you see the purple dot in the middle of your screen, that is the land of Israel where the Jewish people originated. And when they were expelled and for various other reasons, they moved to parts of North Africa, the Middle East, Europe, and parts of Asia. And when they moved, they eventually picked up a version of the local language and Judaified it. So there are Jewish versions of all of these languages that you see on your screen right now. Judeo-Italian, Judeo-Greek, Judeo-Persian, Judeo-Tajik, Judeo-Malayalam in southern India. And the two most famous Jewish languages, Yiddish and Ladino, are actually exceptions to this history of diaspora linguistic distinctiveness. Because when the Jews moved from Germanic lands to Slavic lands, they maintained their Germanic language, and that's what we know as Yiddish. And when Jews moved from Spain to the Ottoman Empire and to other places, they maintained their Judeo-Spanish language, and that is what we know as Ladino. But in the other locations where Jews lived, they spoke a Judaized version of the local language, perhaps with Hebrew words often written in Hebrew letters and other distinctive features. And they might be quite similar to the language of their non-Jewish neighbors, or they might be as distinct as to be mutually unintelligible. But all of this changed in the 18th to 20th centuries the languages that had been in these places for hundreds of years were affected by various historical developments, emancipation, modernization, urbanization, and then in the 20th century, the Holocaust and Stalinism. And migrations based on these events to the Americas, to Israel, to Western Europe, led to changes in the languages. Most of the long-standing languages shifted so that people who spoke Yiddish, Ladino, Judeo-Arabic, Jewish Neo-Aramaic, Jewish Malayalam, Judeo-Median, Judeo-Tat, and Judeo-Tajik shifted to English in America and Hebrew in Israel and Spanish in Mexico, for example. And these languages have become mostly endangered with some exceptions, which we'll talk about in a minute. But new languages have developed in these places. Jewish versions of English, of Latin American Spanish, Jewish Portuguese, Jewish Swedish, Jewish French, Jewish German, Jewish Russian, Jewish Hungarian. And these languages are thriving and developing. Now you might think, well, they're not languages, they're just dialects of their local language. And that's true. But it's also the case for many Jewish languages throughout history. Some were so different from the language of their non-Jewish neighbors that you might think of them as separate languages, but many were mutually intelligible. And that is the case with new Jewish languages today. So how are long-standing Jewish languages doing? Well, Yiddish is actually thriving because in Hasidic communities today, children are learning Yiddish. And that is the criterion for the vitality of a language, whether children are learning the language. Elsewhere, there is little intergenerational transmission of Yiddish, but there is strong post-vernacular engagement, meaning that people are involved with Yiddish, interested in Yiddish, even if they can't speak in full conversations. Aside from Yiddish, the other long-standing Jewish languages are endangered or almost endangered. And I'm going to give you examples 
of this phenomenon by talking about Judeo-Arabic, Judeo-Tat, and Judeo-Median. I'm going to give a brief history of each and talk about their current status and post-vernacular activity. Post-vernacular meaning if people aren't speaking the language anymore, but they are still engaging with the language in important ways. So first, Judeo-Arabic. The yellow parts that you see on the screen are where Judeo-Arabic is or was spoken. And it has been spoken since antiquity. You might know of some famous works that were originally written in Judeo-Arabic by Sadia Gaon, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, and Maimonides. And these were written in Hebrew letters. In the 19th and 20th centuries, there were many Judeo-Arabic periodicals from Bombay to Algeria to Egypt to Tunisia, etc. And there are many varieties of Judeo-Arabic, Libyan, Moroccan, Tunisian, Egyptian, Yemenite, Iraqi, Syrian, and Palestinian. And in general, these were the way that the Jews spoke in these places were more similar to the local non-Jewish variety than to the Jewish varieties in other places, but they also shared some common traits. Let me give you some examples of how diverse Judeo-Arabics can be. How do you say matzah in Judeo-Arabic? Well, in Yemenite Judeo-Arabic, it's mashumor. In Iraqi Judeo-Arabic, yerdukai. In Egyptian Judeo-Arabic, fatir. And I apologize for my pronunciation, but I just wanted to give you a sense of how different these languages can be. How do you say charoset? In Yemenite Judeo-Arabic, it's duki. In Iraqi Judeo-Arabic, hilk, silan, or shira. And in Libyan Judeo-Arabic, lahlik. And they also look different and taste different in those different places. Now, what happened to Judeo-Arabic? Well, in the 1940s through 1960s, most Judeo-Arabic speakers moved to Israel, France, Mexico, Canada, and the US, and their descendants speak Hebrew, French, Spanish, and English. Most of the people who speak Judeo-Arabic today are elderly. There are still some communities in North Africa today, about 3,000 Jews in Morocco, but most of them speak French. About 1,100 Jews in Tunisia, most of them speak Muslim Tunisian Arabic, but the elderly there still speak some Judeo-Arabic. And there is post-vernacular activity, especially with music. For example, in Israel, Neta al Kayam has a tribute to the Moroccan Jewish singer Zohra al Fasya. And also in Israel, Awa, a Yemenite Judeo Arabic group, sings Yemenite, traditional Jewish Yemenite Judeo Arabic music with a contemporary beat. And tonight you'll have the pleasure of hearing Asher Shasho Levi, who sings Syrian Judeo Arabic music in a traditional style in the US. How is Judeo-Arabic doing today? Well, as you might guess, it is not doing great. It is moribund because the only remaining active users are elderly. And I'm using the characterizations of vitality from Ethnologue, which provides statistics about languages in general and is the go-to place for how many people speak each language. But there is some post-vernacular use of Arabic. It is important for group identity to some extent. Now we move on to the second example language, Judeo Tat, also known as Juhuri. It's spoken in this little area here, which is Azerbaijan and Dagestan. The Jews who speak this language are sometimes known as mountain Jews or Gorski or Kavkazim or Caucasian, but all of those are kind of misnomers. They are in cities like Derbent, Baku, and Kuba. The community has been present in this area since ancient times. And their language is a variant of Tat, which is on the Persian branch of the Iranian language family. It's related to Persian and it's similar to Muslim Tat, but there are also many differences. There have been many publications in Judeo Tat written originally in Hebrew letters, then Latin starting in 1930, and then Cyrillic starting in 1938. And you can see some examples here of periodicals and books that were written from 1908 through 1991. 
And in fact, in 1938, Tat or Judeo-Tat was one of the 10 official languages in the USSR Republic of Dagestan, making it one of the few Jewish languages that has ever been an official language of a country. But from the 19th century to today, Judeo-Tat has slowly been replaced by Azerbaijani, Russian, and other languages in the Caucasus region, and by Hebrew in Israel. Some older people still use it, and parents still use it as a secret language when they don't want the kids to understand. There is some post-vernacular activity, some music in Judeo-Tat. We won't get to hear any of that tonight, but I recommend checking the Jewish language website for some examples. However, Judeo-Tat is still transmitted to children in one town, Kirmizi Kasaba, Azerbaijan. This is basically a Jewish town, and most of the people who live in this town are Jewish and therefore have been able to maintain their language. But even in Kirmizi Kasaba, all community members also speak other languages and educational instruction is in other languages. So the vitality of Judeo-Tat is threatened. The language is used for face-to-face -face communication within all generations, but it's losing users. And now our final example, Judeo-Median. Judeo-Median is a language family within Iran. It is an Iranian non-Persian language, so you can see on this language tree that it's not on the Persian branch of the Iranian language family, it's on the northwestern branch. And there are actually several Judeo-Median languages that are not mutually intelligible. Here I give you just a few examples of words in Judeo-Kashani, Judeo-Isfahani, Judeo-Hamadani, Judeo-Yazdi, and Judeo-Shirazi. And you can see how different these languages are. In the mid 20th century, most Jews in these areas moved to Tehran and other major cities and shifted to modern Persian with some Hebrew words. And from 1979 to the present, most Jews from Iran have emigrated, especially to New York, LA, and Israel. So the vitality of Judeo-Median is nearly extinct. The only remaining users of the language are elderly and have little opportunity to use the language. And there's also very little research on Judeo-Median, so we don't actually know how many speakers there are. So in conclusion, most long-standing Jewish language varieties are endangered as their speakers are all or mostly elderly. And in the next 20 to 30 years, the last speakers will die. So now is the time to document the language varieties, cultures, and histories of Jewish communities around the world. And it's also time to share that knowledge. Why? For the last speakers of these languages, like Dr. Nasser Baravarian from New York, who is one of the last speakers of Judeo-Isfahani and is being recorded by the Endangered Language Alliance. For Dr. Yona Sabar from Los Angeles, who is one of the last speakers of Jewish Neo-Aramaic. And you can see here a book that his son wrote about his language and culture. And in memory of Sarah Cohen from Cochin, India, who was one of the last speakers of Jewish Malayalam, and she just died a few months ago. But it's also important for the future, for research and for students who want to learn these languages for Jews around the world to know about these languages and to know about communities all around the world. And it's also useful for other groups, indigenous, immigrant, and religious groups to learn about Jewish languages and hear about their history and how Jews today are engaging with them in post-vernacular ways. So how? How can we document these languages and share the information? Through the organization that I have just started, the Jewish Language Project of Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, our mission is to promote research on, awareness about, and engagement surrounding the many languages spoken and written by Jews throughout history and around the world. And this is our first event. And we have also created a Passover Haggadah supplement so that you can share these languages at your Passover Seder. It gives examples of how to say happy Passover and various phrases in many Jewish languages and songs and parts of the Seder that you can recite in these languages. 
You can also see materials on the Jewish language website from Passover and from other aspects where you can get clips, video clips, audio clips, and texts. For example, how do you say Happy Passover in Judeo-Arabic, Judeo-Tat, and Judeo-Median? Well, Judeo-Arabic in Morocco, you say Ikun Lik Eid Mubarak. In Judeo-Tat, Nisan Nushmu Shor Giro, which means may your Passover Nisan pass happily. And we don't actually know, I don't know, how to say Happy Passover in Judeo-Median because there hasn't been enough research on that. And that's why this kind of documentation is so important. So the next initiative of the HUC Jewish Language Project, in conjunction with the Endangered Language Alliance, is a documentation project of endangered Iranian Jewish languages in Los Angeles. Unitzt, this is mir größer COVID, not COVID-19. It is a great honor for me to introduce to you the first musical act, Book of J, Julia Eisenberg and Jeremiah Lockwood singing in Yiddish. Uh, hello, uh, this is Julia Eisenberg. And this is Jeremiah Lockwood. And we're the Book of J, and we're greatly honored to be joining you for Passover Around the World, virtually from Oakland, California. Oakland. And uh, we're going to begin with the Fir Kashas, which is a Yiddish language version of Manishtana, the children's uh, questions that begin the, begin the Seder. And we're going to be um, doing a version that we learned from the Malavsky family chorus, featuring the great cantor, who is also a woman, Goldie Malavsky. And the words that we're singing are slightly different than what's in your program because we're singing Goldie's words. Okay. Now we're moving on to Magid, which is the storytelling part of the Seder, and we're going to play a song called Afen Neil, uh, based on a poem by Avram Reisen, the well-known Yiddish poet, and music by Michal Gelbart, who's a more obscure personality from uh, mid-20th century Yiddish New York, who was a pedagogue and wrote books about music for kids, and he also wrote a, a book about his childhood as a, a, a cantorial choir boy, called uh, Fun Mishur's Leben, which is a, a wonderful source of knowledge about uh, the lived experience of little boys who lived this kind of anarchic life as uh, uh, the band for, for a cantor on tour in Eastern Europe. 
Uh, so this is Afinil, which creates an image of Mo baby Moses' uh, basket floating down the river. a lot. It's about the power and longevity of a ritual object, the glass that's it's used for Pesach. And um, our narrator kind of takes us through that it's used by the grandfather and that it's going to be used by future generations and that we're even going to drink L'chaim to our enemies with this, but don't let them know. Und 
Wir wo sein in Gefahr, denn ein Rebecke weg. Er trinkt meine Sonne, wenn sonst ein All right, well now we're going to do a Yiddish language version of Chagadya. This is called Ditzigala, which means the little goat. And we found this version on Itzik Gottesman's uh, wonderful Yiddish Song of the Week blog. Uh, in our video being, being sung by a woman named Pam Singer, uh, who remembered the song as being part of her family's Seder ritual. They would, they would sing this Yiddish language version of Chagadya. So Di Tzigala, it sounds like a folk song, but it's actually by a guy. Uh, his name is Yitzchak Peroshnikov, who's kind of an idiosyncratic figure in Jewish music around the turn of the century. Uh, he invented a modern style for playing the concertina and developed a virtuoso repertoire where he could play blisteringly fast on, on the concertina and took that on the road, got famous with it. And this is his version of the Tzigala.
Hi, this is our last song, Moa Sapro. It's a version of Echad Mi Odea. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us be a part of this this beautiful concept. Many thanks to, to Sarah Ben-Or for organizing and having the vision for this. Uh, we're honored to be, be participating. And thanks for um, letting us participate in this way. All right. So, uh, Moa Sapro. <laughs> Shasho Levy and Chloe Purmarati, and they will be singing in multiple languages. So we're going to begin um, by actually singing the order of the seder in Hebrew, as many Jewish communities do around the world, but we're going to sing different melodies, um, starting with the uh, Halabi Syrian melody, and then transitioning into a related melody from Turkey, 
and then going from that into the uh, Persian melody. instruments before we continue. Uh, Asher, go first. Yes, yeah, so the us. instrument that I uh, have the honor to play, the honor to play really every day of my life and to grow and to learn with this instrument um, is the oud, an instrument that has been called in the Arabic world the king of the instruments. Um, uh, and it's an instrument that embodies much history and much travels. They say that the oud um, developed in the Fertile Crescent in Mesopotamia, perhaps from actually an Iranian instrument, the barbat, and uh, traveled much throughout the years, throughout um, the Arab world, through North Africa and into Spain in the early Middle Ages. And there it transformed into many European instruments, actually, into the lute, the word aloud, which means wood, um, transformed into the word lute. And from the lute, the guitar developed and the different mandolin instruments. And so really, the oud is the, um, is the springboard from all of, for all of our, our fretted and uh, uh, plucked stringed instruments that we have today in the Western world. And really the thing that, that most separates the oud from the guitar and the mandolin and all of those other instruments is um, 
the fretting system, or rather the lack of frets that the oud has. So like a violin or like a cello, the oud is a, a fretless instrument. It has, um, the oud as we currently know it, it used to have um, only these, um, these five courses of doubled strings, but over time they added this sixth string, so it now has 11 strings. Um, they're tuned in fourths, and fretless, as I mentioned, so that you can play all of the different scales that you would find in Arabic music, and Turkish music, Persian music. Um, and it's a beautiful, beautiful instrument, and it's uh, always a pleasure to, to grow and learn with the oud. And uh, Chloe, why don't you tell us about the kamanche? So this is kamanche, it's a traditional, um you know, Persian classical instrument, very, very old. Um, this is like Asher's instrument that is like a, a predecessor to so many modern instruments that we have today. I like to think of the Kamanche as like the grandfather to the violin. Um, and this one is from Lorestan, which is a region of Iran um, that's actually very popular for being very music heavy in Lorestan. And it's kind of unusual because it's cone-shaped. Most camanches you see are, are fully round. Um, and uh, I'm mainly a violinist. I picked up this instrument somewhat recently. And I love it because it has a very ancient, very humble, um, somewhat quiet sound. And uh, the bow, unlike a violin bow, um, I actually have to uh, create separation between the hair and the stick to get a sound and the sound is very very soft it doesn't scream it doesn't yell like a violin it's pretty it's pretty humble it's pretty quiet um, I like to think that both these instruments are good friends yes and so <laughs> they play well together yeah they do yeah. play well together and that's why we wanted to try it in this way uh, today to complement um, these traditions that we're sharing with you uh, so the next thing that we are going to do is Misharotam. Misharotam. So this is a beautiful tradition. I'm going to put down my oud for a second because we're not going to need it for the Misharotam. I'm actually going to replace my oud with a matzah. And note that I'm not saying matzah, I'm saying masah in the traditional pronunciation of my family of Syrian Jews. Um, so this is a, a, a custom that I actually look forward to at the Seder every year where we take the middle masa of the three masot that are placed on the seder table, and we break it into two pieces. We take um, the smaller piece is broken into the shape of the letter vav, and the bigger piece is broken into a dalit. It looks like a hay, actually. Um, there's kabbalistic significance for that, for um, the names of God. So you have it looking like a hay, um, like the tefillin almost. Um, and so the smaller piece is placed back between the matzot, and then the larger piece is taken here like we're doing now, and this will become the afikoman. But before we go and we hide it and we continue on with the telling of the story, we have a little bit of a ritual that we do, a little bit of a part of the telling of the story where we really, we really act it out. So the leader of the seder is going to do what I'm about to do right now. Take the masa in this napkin and places it in the right hand over the left shoulder of the participants of the seder and waves it while singing this verse. Misharotam serurot besimlotam al shikmam ubene Israel asukid bar Moshe, which means their remaining possessions tied up in their bags on their shoulders, and the children of Israel did as Moses commanded. So we're acting out this moment in the Exodus where the children of Israel were leaving were with their possessions over their shoulders, and then we do a little skit in Arabic. Minje. And so that means, where are you coming from? Mimisraim, from Egypt. Where are you going? Lirushalayim. And we go around on the seder table and we do this with the masa to every participant until we've gone around to every single person. And then we reach the next step of the seder, which is the halachman. Yeah. Um, we're going to do the halachmania and a few traditions. Um, in Asher's Syrian tradition, my Persian Judeo tradition, we're going to do it in Ladino as well. Yes? Yes. We'll start with the Syrian. <laughs> ah. 
اللحم عن يدي خل ابحاثنا باراد مصرايم كل دي خفين يتي فيخل كل دي صريح في يتي فيفسح الشتاخة لشناب باراد اسرائيل الشتاخة افضي لشناب باراد اسرائيل بن حوري הלחמן ידי אכלו, אפתנה בהר אדם ישראלים, כל דבחין יתה ויכול, כל דסיך יתה ויסח, השתה הבא לשנה הבאה, לשנה הבאה בהר אד ישראל, השתה אחריו ידי לשנה הבאה בהר אד ישראל, Now, in the Syrian tradition, we also chant it in Judeo-Arabic. So this is the Judeo-Arabic of the Halakh Ma'anya, as it would be chanted by Jews from Aleppo. <laughs> And one last language of the Halakh Ma'anya, I'm going to chant it now according to the Ladino tradition of Turkish Jews from Istanbul. Esta el pan de la friskion que como eon muestros padre en tierra de Aifto. Todo en que tiene hambre venga en como. Todo en que tiene muestre venga en paz que esta año aquí. A el año en viene en tierra de Israel. Esta año aquí siervos. A el año en viene en tierra de Israel. Y los foros. So we're going to continue along with our journey through the music of the Seder from various communities of the pan-Sephardic diaspora. Um, and now we're going to move into music of celebration, really, of the, of the beauty of Pesach. And in different Sephardic communities, um, the Hallel is really celebrated and really um, lifted up through different melodies um, that are particularly beautiful. But something that may not be so well known is the emphasis on really joyful major key melodies, particularly among um, the Jews of Edot HaMizrach, among Syrian Jews, Iraqi Jews, Yerushalmi Jews, is that on holidays, on Pesach in particular, there's an emphasis on uh, lifting up the music with really absolutely joyful melodies for the Hallel. Very simple, pure melodies that people can learn from childhood. So we're going to focus on the text of, of Min HaMissar Karatiya, from the, from the narrow straits uh, I called to God, um, which is a central text of the Hallel. And we're going to focus on three different melodies that are all melodies that I learned um, as a child um, in the Syrian community. The first one I learned from my, my grandfather, my Jiddo Allah Shalom, um, and it's a classic Syrian melody from Min Hamasar. And then the second one is also a melody that I learned in the Syrian community, but it's actually Iraqi. It comes from an Iraqi folk song, Tala Min Bet Abuha. And then the third melody, also I learned in a Syrian context, but it's actually a Spanish Sephardic melody for Shirat Hayam that was proliferated in the Syrian community and throughout many, many different Sephardic communities, um, even among the London Spanish Portuguese community, this melody exists. So you're going to get a taste of three different ways of singing the Hallel um, that would be common in not only Syrian Sephardic communities, but different Sephardic communities throughout the diaspora. Mm -hmm. And for me, because you know I come from a Persian Jewish tradition, we didn't have, uh, it was actually the assignment to search for melodies for this concert was very, very difficult um, from my tradition to find anything. It's really such a treat for me to learn these beautiful melodies from uh, other Middle Eastern Jewish traditions. And even though we don't have you in our audience physically, I want you to allow yourself um, to sing along. 
if you catch on to these melodies because Please. they're so beautiful and accessible and, and singable, really. They're very, very special. Yeah, and please, if, if some of these melodies are compelling and you, you find yourself singing them, take them into your, into your lives. Sing them around your, around your seder table because these are not you know, melodies for an archive or for a museum. These are melodies that, you know, certainly in my family, we sing them all the time, not just on Pesach, we sing them throughout the year. So, um, you know, bring this music and these traditions into your lives because this is, this is living tradition. Mm. This is not something for, you know, just an archive or a museum. This is something for, for your soul. Mm, exactly.
We're going to continue celebrating because at this point in the seder, you would have eaten, you would be, you'd be stuffed with delicious food, you would be singing, 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 and the seder would be basically mostly over in substance because halel nirsa, hasel sidur pesach, the seder is over. So you get to the point in the seder where what do you have left to do? but just sing, and, and sing what sort of songs? Well, basically fun songs. And these fun songs are, at this point, basically in the vernacular of the different Sephardic communities. So, um, for instance, in, in the case of our family, Halabi Jews, at this point, start to sing a lot of beautiful songs in, uh, and really fun songs in Judeo-Arabic. And Jews from Istanbul and, and Judeo-Spanish Jews from the Ottoman Empire sing really fun songs in um, and Judeo-Spanish. And then there's a beautiful tradition of these songs at the end of the Seder are also in Hebrew, these piyutim um, that different Jewish communities sing. So I think that's what we're going to do now is one of these piyutim. Yes, ki lo na'eh. I would like to thank Galit Dardashti for helping me with this one, uh, help me, helping me find this one, um, a Persian Jewish melody for this tune. Persian Jewish doesn't necessarily mean it was from Iran um, because I've shown this melody to several family members and other you know, people I'm connected to and they didn't know it. So it could be from another part of that whole Persian world. Um, I do want to share one thing that's good for you to know and the reason why it was difficult to find um, Judeo-Persian repertoire uh, because there, there were a lot of laws um, in Iran pre-revolution that uh, you know our, our sacred music had to be very, very minimal, very monotone, limited to maybe like three notes. Um, so we don't have a lot of Persian Jewish melodies. We have Persian melodies um, in Farsi, um, but not for, not for the holidays. So uh, very, very limited. Um, so if I, whenever I find something, it's like finding gold. It really is very, very special. So happy to have found this one. <laughs> Oh, no. 
selection of songs that we sing at the end of the seder in every community um, when things get a little a little fun mm -hmm. about the little goat mm -hmm. so we're gonna sing a few different versions of Hadgadya actually this is the first of the two that we're gonna do uh, actually three that we're gonna do um, and this is the, the, the Judeo-Spanish version from Turkey. One of a few melodies, but uh, we're going to just do this one. Oh. 
So that would be a little bit of, there, there are more verses than that. If we did all of the verses to all of the versions of Chag Gadya that we were doing now, this would be a very, very long Very, concert. very long. Program. Yes, very, very long. So we're saving you from that. But uh, we're going to do another version now. Um, this is a, a version from Syria, but not from my particular Syrian community. This is from the other community, from the Shami Jews of Damascus. Um, I'm not going to talk about the Shami Jews of Damascus right now. <laughs> That's a joke only some of you will get. <laughs> but this song is very nice. This is Wahad Jidi, um, and it's the one little goat. <laughs> And we're going to do um, just a few verses of this, because if you did all of the verses of this, really, it would be very, very, very long. But uh, I'm going to start with a, just a little bit of a little bit of oud, so you'll get a feeling for the um, for the scale. Because even though this is a song that's meant to be sung after a long meal and four cups of wine, this is in maqam ras, which has some microtones. So. Um... <laughs> Wa 
خدمه لكن موت الا دي احرخ الدبح الا دي تابح البحر الا دي شرب الميه الا دي تافت النار الا دي حرقت الصيد الا دي ضربت الكلب الا دي عاد المطبخ الا دي اكلت الجدين الا دي اشتراني ابي a little wahajidi. Now we're going to move on to another another Sedr song from Syria, from my community, from the Halabi community. And this one is Ehad uh, Odea. This one is Who Knows One. Um, and it's actually... It's actually not who knows one. That's not actually how it exactly translates to. It's min uh, alam min yadri. It's who can know and who can understand, um, and that shares some uh, some textual similarities with the Ladino version, which is very interesting. Um, but this is uh, we're going to do the same thing that we did with the last few songs, where I'll do the first few stanzas and then the last few stanzas, because again, if I did them all, we'd be here till Pesach. And, and those of you at home would like to sing along, the refrain at the end of every verse is Allahu, Allahu, La illa illahu. Really, you can find all of the words on the website, mm -hmm. and print them out. You can listen, and you can learn them, and bring something new and fresh. Yeah, not nah, like something old and fresh. It's yes, people have been singing these songs for hundreds of years, but it'll be maybe new to your center. Old and fresh. Old and fresh. 
This one is old and fresh, isn't it, Chloe? Yeah, this one is very old and fresh. This one is very exciting. It's called Jean Bouzgola, and it's a Bukharian Jewish tune um, for the same thing for Khad Gadia. And um, this one was fun for me to learn because uh, Bukharian dialect has a lot of Farsi in it, so it's not too, too foreign. And um, what I'm looking at right now, what I'm reading, just so you know what, what it is that we're looking at, is we're looking at Hebrew, and we're looking at Arabic, Hebrew, he Arabic words with Hebrew letters, I'm looking at Bukharian words in Hebrew, um, with Russian kind of lyric translation, and English, Latin words as well. Uh, so we're going to try just a few verses of this one, Jean Bouzgola. And this is very easy, you can sing along um, to the, the refrain, the chorus. Jean Bouzgola, Jean Bouzgola. Uh, Chloe, what, what, is a, what is Jean Bouzgola? What does that mean? Um, Bouzgola, it's like, uh, like a goat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And John, John in Farsi means many things. It means life, it means spirit, but also means dear. Like we can call someone like John a man or June a man. Uh, you could call a friend and be like, Asher, June, you know? So, John Buzgola, it's like deer or sweet goat. It's the only <laughs> only version of Chagadya that calls the goat sweet, sweet goat. goat. Yes. <laughs> Moadim um, lesimcha, everyone. Yes. A happy, healthy holiday. Yes. Happy, healthy, and that you can bring joy 
into everything that you do, even in the darkest of times, that you can yeah. find joy in this time. Yeah, this, may this moed be for simcha for everyone. Yeah. And now, the grand finale, Who Knows One, in two languages. First, we have Ladino, performed by Cantigas Muestras, Simone Salmon, director, Ruby Hanan, and Sarah Schwartz. Enjoy. I'm Simone, I'm director of Cantigas Muestras and UC Ladino. Um, Cantigas Muestras is a community chorus that sings in Ladino. This is Ruby Hanan and this is Sarah Schwartz, and we'll be singing Can Su Piense the Way That Our Mothers Would. <laughs>
And we complete our evening with a performance of Jewish English, which is a continuation of our Jewish linguistic heritage. We are continuing the practices of our ancestors around the world, of translating the Passover Haggadah into many languages and Judaifying them. So you'll see how this plays out in Who Knows One in Jewish English, performed by HUC students Tamara Cohen and Aaron Levine. Hey, Aaron. Yes, Tammy? Who knows one? I know one. One is God. One is God. One is God in the heavens and the earth. Ba -da 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 -da. Who knows two? I know two. Two are the tablets that Moshe brought. And one is God. One is God. One is God in the heavens and the earth. Ba -da 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 -da. Who knows three? I know three. Three are the fathers and two are the tablets that Moshe brought. And one is God. One is God. One is God in the heavens and the earth. Ba -da 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 -da. Who knows four? I know four. Four are the mothers and three are the fathers and two are the tablets that Moshe brought. And one is God. One is God. the books of the Torah. Four are the mothers and three are the fathers and two are the tablets that Moshe brought. And one is God. One is God. One is God in the heavens and the earth. Ba -da 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 -da. Who knows six? I know six. Six are the books of the Mishnah. Five are the books of the Torah. Four are the mothers and three are the fathers and two are the tablets that Moshe brought and one is God. One is God. One is God in the heavens and the earth. Ba -da 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 -da. Who knows seven? I know seven. Seven are the days of the week. Six, Six are the books of the Mishnah. Five are the books of the Torah. Four are the mothers and three are the fathers and two are the tablets that Moshe brought and one is God. One is God, one is God in the heavens and the earth. Ba -da 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 -da. Okay, but who knows 13? Hmm, 13. Oh, I know 13. 13 are the attributes of God. 12 are the tribes of Israel. 11 are the stars. Joseph's dream. Ten are the Ten Commandments. Nine are the months till a baby's born. Eight are the days before a Brit Mila. Seven are the days of the week. Six are the books of the Mishnah. Five are the books of the Torah. Four are the mothers and three are the fathers and two are the tablets and Moshe brought. And one is God. One is some thank yous. First, thank you to our sponsors, Hebrew Union College, the Jewish Language Project, Association for Jewish Studies, the USC Kasdan Institute for the Study of the Jewish Role in American Life, and the Pico Union Project, and our co-sponsors, the UCLA Mickey Katz Endowed Chair in Jewish Music, UC Ladino, Got Kosher, Bechol Shon, 30 Years After, and Yiddishkeit. Thank you also to the volunteers and staff who made this evening possible. You can read about them in the virtual program, and you can also read the bios of the performers. We're so glad that you were able to join us today, and we hope that you'll continue to participate by looking at the Jewish Language website and seeing all of the resources that we have there. Happy Passover!